Hi, and thanks for watching this message video. Today, we're starting a brand new series where we're going to be highlighting different people throughout the Bible that had an amazing relationship with God that made them stand out. Or in other words, there was something about their words or their actions or the way that they lived their life that it differentiated them from everybody else around them. The first person that we're going to be talking about is a woman by the name of Mary of Bethany. If you're not familiar with where Bethany is at, it's about two miles outside of Jerusalem at the base of the Mount of Olives. And when it comes to Mary, it's hard to differentiate sometimes the Marys. If you've read through the Gospels, you know that there's a lot of them. For instance, there's Mary, the mother of Jesus, and then there's Mary Magdalene or Mary of Magdalena. And both of them are standouts for God, and we're actually going to be talking about them later on in this series. And then there's a woman by the name of Mary who was the mother of James and Joseph, or James and John, I mean, who were both disciples of Jesus. And this Mary, even though she had a relationship with Christ, she didn't stand out in a good way. In fact, she stood out in a bad way. Here's why I say that. Matthew 20, 17 through 28. As Jesus was going up to Jerusalem, he took the 12 disciples aside privately and told them what was going to happen to him. Listen, he said, we're going up to Jerusalem where the Son of Man will be betrayed to the leading priests and the teachers of religious law. They will sentence him to die. Then they will hand him over to the Romans to be mocked, flogged with a whip and crucified. But on the third day, he will be raised from the dead. Then the mother of James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came to Jesus with her sons. She knelt respectfully to ask a favor. What is your request? He asked. She replied, In your kingdom, please let my two sons sit in places of honor next to you, one on your right hand and the other on your left. But Jesus answered by saying to them, You don't know what you are asking. Are you able to drink from the bitter cup of suffering I am about to drink? Oh, yes, they replied. We are able. Jesus told them, You will indeed drink from my bitter cup. But I have no right to say who will sit on my right or my left. My father has prepared those places for the ones he has chosen. When the ten other disciples heard what James and John had asked, they were indignant. But Jesus called them together and said, You know that the rulers in this world lord it over their people, and officials flaunt their authority over those under them. But among you it will be different. Whoever wants to be a leader among you must be your servant, and whoever wants to be first among you must become your slave. For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve others and to give his life as a ransom for many. Mary, the mother of James and John, comes across as a mom who was willing to manipulate or do anything she can to the circumstances of life in order to make sure that her sons were achieving success, even if it meant that others who were more deserving don't get what they really have worked hard for. This is pretty common. This is actually fairly typical in our world, which means Mary, the mom of James and John, really isn't a standout. There's no way that you and I can try to use Jesus as a means to a personal end, even if that end is a vicarious end. And so Mary, the mother of James and John, is not a standout. Mary of Bethany was, though, and the reason why is because everything about her relationship with Jesus indicates that her motive for being around him wasn't for personal gain. It was because she was so appreciative of what it is that he had done for her. And what he did for her is what a lot of scholars speculate, including myself, even though I'm not a scholar, is that he saved her life, literally. For instance, if you're not familiar with the story of the woman who was caught in adultery and then brought to Jesus, here's what we're told. John 8, 1 through 11. Jesus returned to the Mount of Olives, but early the next morning he was back again at the temple. A crowd soon gathered, and he sat down and taught them. As he was speaking, the teachers of religious law and the Pharisees brought a woman who had been caught in the act of adultery. They put her in front of the crowd. Teacher, they said to Jesus, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. The law of Moses says to stone her. What do you say? They were trying to trap him into saying something they could use against him. But Jesus stooped down and wrote in the dust with his finger. They kept demanding an answer, so he stood up again and said, All right! But let the one who has never sinned throw the first stone. Then he stooped down again and wrote in the dust. When the accusers heard this, they slipped away one by one, beginning with the oldest, until only Jesus was left in the middle of the crowd with the woman. Then Jesus stood up again and said to the woman, Where are your accusers? Didn't even one of them condemn you? No, Lord, she said. And Jesus said, Neither do I. Go and sin no more. We are told that these men were trying to trap Jesus, and so it's very possible that they were aware of Jesus' relationship with this woman 
that was caught in adultery. And what they were trying to do was see whether or not he would break the law in order to save a friend. But we don't know that for sure. What we do know is that this woman's life was more than likely changed forever and that Mary of Bethany's life was changed forever in a way exactly like this. And this was the reason why she formed such an allegiance to Jesus. For instance, as I said earlier, they were probably aware, these Pharisees, these religious leaders, that Jesus had spent a lot of time in and around the area of Bethany staying with Martha and her sister Mary and her brother Lazarus. And as he got to know them and stayed in that area frequently, he was often teaching. And if you didn't know this, when it came to women at that point in time, their role wasn't necessarily one like a man's role. And so sitting around at the feet of Jesus listening to his teachings wasn't exactly what she was supposed to be doing. At least that's the way that her sister thought about it. Here's what we're told. Luke 10, 38 through 42. As Jesus and the disciples continued on their way to Jerusalem, they came to a certain village where a woman named Martha welcomed him into her home. Her sister Mary sat at the Lord's feet, listening to what he taught. But Martha was distracted by the big dinner she was preparing. She came to Jesus and said, Lord, doesn't it seem unfair to you that my sister just sits here while I do all the work? Tell her to come and help me. But the Lord said to her, My dear Martha, you are worried and upset over all these details. There is only one thing worth being concerned about. Mary has discovered it, and it will not be taken away from her. The way that Jesus made it sound to Martha was that Mary recently had had a change of heart, or that she recently had discovered something, and now her priorities had changed. Whereas before she may have been doing what it is that she was supposed to do, now she's wanting to spend as much time with Jesus as she possibly can. Is that what happened to you? Jesus saved your life, and you know it. And as a direct result, you just can't get enough. You just want to spend time with him. You just want to be around him. You want, to, you want to make sure that he knows how thankful you are and how appreciative you are for what it is that he's done for you. And now you're living like a standout. And your life has changed and everybody who is around you has seen that. And, and, and it might even bother them, but it doesn't matter. This is one of the reasons why Mary of Bethany stood out for Jesus. But maybe the biggest reason why she stood out was because of the way that she treated him right before his death. If you haven't heard, there was this situation where she anointed his feet and his head with expensive oil, and it made quite a scene. Here's the way that both Matthew and Luke describe this story. Matthew 26, 6 through 13. Meanwhile, Jesus was in Bethany at the home of Simon, a man who had previously had leprosy. While he was eating, a woman came in with a beautiful alabaster jar of expensive perfume and poured it over his head. The disciples were indignant when they saw this. What a waste, they said. It could have been sold for a high price and the money given to the poor. But Jesus, aware of this, replied, Why criticize this woman for doing such a good thing to me? You will always have the poor among you, but you will not always have me. She has poured this perfume on me to prepare my body for burial. I tell you the truth, wherever the good news is preached throughout the world, this woman's deed will be remembered and discussed. Luke 7, 36 through 50. One of the Pharisees asked Jesus to have dinner with him. So Jesus went to his home and sat down to eat. When a certain immoral woman from that city heard he was eating there, she brought a beautiful alabaster jar filled with expensive perfume. Then she knelt behind him at his feet, weeping. Her tears fell on his feet, and she wiped them off with her hair. Then she kept kissing his feet and putting perfume on them. When the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, If this man were a prophet, he would know what kind of woman is touching him. She's a sinner! Then Jesus answered his thoughts. Simon, he said to the Pharisee, I have something to say to you. Go ahead, teacher, Simon replied. Then Jesus told him this story. A man loaned money to two people, 500 pieces of silver to one and 50 pieces to the other. But neither of them could repay him, so he kindly forgave them both, canceling their debts. Who do you suppose loved him more after that? Simon answered, I suppose the one whom he canceled the larger debt. That's right, Jesus said. Then he turned to the woman and said to Simon, Look at this woman kneeling here. When I entered your home, you didn't offer me water to wash the dust from my feet, but she has washed them with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You didn't greet me with a kiss, but from the time I first came in, she has not stopped kissing my feet. You neglected the courtesy of olive oil to anoint my head, but she has anointed my feet with rare perfume. I tell you her sins, and they are many, have been forgiven. So she has shown me much love. 
But a person who is forgiven little shows only little love. Then Jesus said to the woman, your sins are forgiven. The men at the table said among themselves, who is this man that he goes around forgiving sins? And Jesus said to the woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. So here is a man that Jesus presumably healed from leprosy who is showing his utter disgust and his judgment on this woman. And then we have the disciples who were just as judgmental as what she is. And then you have Mary of Bethany who is showing so much thankfulness for the forgiveness that God has given to her that she can't help but unashamedly demonstrate it in a way that makes everybody else around her feel what? Nothing. That's a standout. That's amazing. Let me ask you this. Is your gratitude and your thankfulness for God's forgiveness so overpowering to you that you can't help but become emotional? That you can't help but sing praises to him or unashamedly demonstrate it and how you are so thankful and so appreciative. It doesn't matter what other people think. Is that the way you stand out? This is just one of the ways that Mary of Bethany stood out. She wanted to spend time with Jesus and she was so thankful for what it was, what it was that he had done that she couldn't help but show it. Maybe one of the hardest ways or maybe one of the most difficult things for any of us to go through that would stop us from being a standout is when we're facing the sickness or the potential death of one of our loved ones, which is exactly what Mary and Martha faced with their, their brother, Lazarus. But because Jesus was so close to them, the truth is, is that everybody expected Jesus just to step up and heal him. Everything's going to be okay. Is that what you think of Jesus? of God, that it's his duty, that it's his responsibility to make sure that he heals up your loved ones who are sick and takes care of them. Have you ever heard somebody say, how could God let my blank die? Brother, mother, father, baby. What about you? Have you ever been in a situation where you've been praying, God, please heal Please help. Do you have this expectation? And, and if he, he doesn't, what happens? Do you bail? Do you have the kind of mindset that says that God is obligated to make sure that you and those who are around you don't suffer pain and that you get to experience your ideal version of life, that that's God's job? I know there's a lot of people like myself who have had that mindset. And actually what Jesus was doing in this situation, he was trying to correct that bad mindset in the lives of everybody, particularly his disciples, and in this family. That's what he was trying to do in here. In fact, the disciple John described very well what Jesus was doing here to try to help people who have this kind of bad mindset. John 11, 1 through 35. A man named Lazarus was sick. He lived in Bethany with his sisters, Mary and Martha. This is the Mary who later poured the expensive perfume on the Lord's feet and wiped them with her hair. Her brother Lazarus was sick. So the two sisters sent a message to Jesus telling him, Lord, your dear friend is very sick. But when Jesus heard about it, he said, Lazarus's sickness will not end in death. No, it happened for the glory of God so that the Son of God will receive glory from this. So although Jesus loved Martha, Mary, and Lazarus, he stayed where he was for the next two days. Finally, he said to his disciples, let's go back to Judea. But his disciples objected. Rabbi, they said, only a few days ago, the people in Judea were trying to stone you. Are you going there again? Jesus replied, there are 12 hours of daylight every day. During the day, people can walk safely. They can see because they have the light of this world. But at night, there is danger of stumbling because they have no light. Then he said, our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but now I will go and wake him up. The disciples said, Lord, if he is sleeping, he will soon get better. They thought Jesus meant Lazarus was simply sleeping, but Jesus meant Lazarus had died. So he told them plainly, Lazarus is dead. And for your sakes, I'm glad I wasn't there, for now you will really believe. Come, 
Let's go see him. Thomas, nicknamed the twins, said to his fellow disciples, let's go too and die with Jesus. When Jesus arrived at Bethany, he was told that Lazarus had already been in his grave for four days. Bethany was only a few miles down the road from Jerusalem, and many of the people had come to console Martha and Mary in their loss. When Martha got word that Jesus was coming, she went to meet him, but Mary stayed in the house. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if only you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now I know that God will give you whatever you ask. Jesus told her, your brother will rise again. Yes, Martha said. He will rise when everyone else rises at the last day. Jesus told her, I am the resurrection and the life. Anyone who believes in me will live even after dying. Everyone who lives in me and believes in me will never ever die. Do you believe this, Martha? Yes, Lord, she told him. I have always believed you are the Messiah, the Son of God, the one who has come into the world from God. Then she returned to Mary. She called Mary aside from the mourners and told her, the teacher is here and wants to see you. So Mary immediately went to him. Jesus had stayed outside the village at the place where Martha met him. When the people who were at the house consoling Mary saw her leave so hastily, they assumed she was going to Lazarus's grave to weep. So they followed her there. When Mary arrived and saw Jesus, she fell at his feet and said, Lord, if only you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping and saw the other people wailing with her, a deep anger welled up within him and he was deeply troubled. Where have you put him? He asked them. They told him, Lord, come and see. Then Jesus wept. Let's stop right here for a second so I can explain why Jesus is crying. Jesus is mad. He is so frustrated, and the reason why is this. He has been telling, particularly these disciples and this family, over and over and over again, listen, I'm going to die, but I'm going to beat death. I'm going to raise from life three days later, and everything is going to be just fine. But instead of embracing this truth, Peter, the so-called leader of all of the apostles and disciples, actually had the nerve to scold Jesus for even mentioning death in the first place. And at this current moment, every single person is losing their minds, proclaiming that death is the winner, and oh Jesus, you are just too late. It's all your fault. Have you ever been in a situation where all of your hard work all of your investment, everything that you have done feels like it was a colossal waste of time and that everything or everyone that you have invested into just doesn't get it, just doesn't get it. If so, then you know exactly, you know exactly what Jesus was feeling and why he was so frustrated and why he was crying. This is Jesus being human dealing with humans, us. Here's what happens next. John 11, 36 through 44. The people who were standing nearby said, see how much he loved him. But some said, this man healed a blind man. Couldn't he have kept Lazarus from dying? Jesus was still angry as he arrived at the tomb, a cave with a stone rolled across its entrance. Roll the stone aside, Jesus told them. But Martha, the dead man's sister, protested, Lord, he's been dead for four days. The smell will be terrible. Jesus responded, didn't I tell you that you would see God's glory if you believe? So they rolled the stone aside. Then Jesus looked up to heaven and said, Father, thank you for hearing me. You always hear me, but I said it out loud for the sake of all these people standing here so that they will believe you sent me. Then Jesus shouted, Lazarus, come out. And the dead man came out, his hands and feet bound in grave clothes, his face wrapped in a head cloth. Jesus told them, unwrap him, and let him go. Jesus beat death. And he so desperately wanted those at that time to know this that it made him emotional. It still does. Jesus wants us to not let something like death stop us from being standouts. So let me ask you this question again. Are you a standout like Mary of Bethany? As God saved your butt and now you recognize it, and as a direct result, you just want to spend as much time getting to know him or being useful to him as you can. And so you're digging into his word and you're praying and, and your thankfulness is through the roof. And you can't help but become emotional, whether that's through tears or singing his praises or spending time talking to other people about how cool you think he is and what it is that he's done for you. And when it comes to situations like sickness or death, do those things derail you because you got a bad mindset? Or have you allowed the Holy Spirit to start changing the way you think about everything, including things like death, because you recognize that Jesus has beat it? And now, 
whenever anything like that happens, you know how to stay a standout for him. This is what God wants from us. And what the truth is, is that when we allow his Holy Spirit to take up all the new changes in our lives and reprogram our ways of thinking and redirect our ways of thinking, we will stand out for God. Remember that. And remember this, Philippians 2, 13 through 15. God is working in you, giving you the desire and the power to do what pleases him. Do everything without complaining and arguing so that no one can criticize you. Live clean, innocent lives as children of God, shining like bright lights or standouts in a world full of crooked and perverse people.